Finally, Rick and Morty season four is back with new episodes, and the story this time around is strong as a boob. Episode six, Never Ricking Morty, is meta as all heck, and it's leaving fans with lots of questions. Was any of this canon? What does this episode mean for the future of the series? I'm Whitney Van Lanningham, and today we're breaking down Never Ricking Morty. Before we get started, I want to give a shout out to our super nerd sponsor of the day, Charles Sheet. Thanks to portal jumpers like them, Nerdwire gets to sail through the multiverse another week. Want to help? Click the link in the description box to see if any of our donation tiers work for you. And don't forget to check out our Tee Public affiliate link. There are tons of cool Rick and Morty shirts in there. Now on to Never Ricking Morty! This is the part where you should pause this video if you haven't watched the episode yet, figure out your life, and then come back later when you've seen what I've seen. Sound good? Cool. Spoilers! Never Ricking Morty is the kind of TV that graduates of the Emerson screenwriting program have wet dreams about. It's essentially an inside baseball look at writing a quote-unquote episode of Rick and Morty. Like, this is the kind of stuff some film professor in the future will force all of their students to dissect and label like a goddamn anatomy frog. So, let's zoom out and simplify this episode. Morty buys a story train from the gift shop at the Citadel of Ricks, which he then bestows upon his drunk nihilistic grandfather, presumably to help kill time during quarantine. Which, side quest, was an incredibly surprising reference. We've been waiting years for this season to air, but somehow they were able to churn out a quick topical reference in a matter of weeks. Like, I know it's just an easy VO pickup, but with the show's glacial track record, it's still surprising. Anyways, inside the toy train is a sort of simulated reality where the passengers are obsessed with talking about Rick, to the point where they compulsively compete to tell the best Rick and Morty anthology story. This is probably due to this train being from the Citadel of Rick's gift shop, and we all know those guys can be self-congratulatory egomaniacs. In reality, all of these characters are just figurines playing out the programming of the train's anthology generator, which guarantees a never-ending supply of Rick and Morty stories. These stories are essentially one-off tales to the tune of common entertainment tropes, like badasses meeting up in a seedy bar, or an unlikable protagonist redeeming himself just in time for Christmas. Also inside the train are a pair of Rick and Mortys who are fighting to get the train's engine to take control and escape the overused fan y tropes of the episode. Essentially, this storyline in the episode is Snowpiercer without the class warfare, or Infinity Train with a lot more blood and cum gutter jokes. When a character within the train is thrown out, they experience a randomized, time-dilated reality that exists outside of the show's canon. So for example, the Ticket Please guy wasn't playing a version of Roy at Blitz and Chips, he was just experiencing a vivid nightmare while he slowly dies outside the air of the train. For simplicity, think of every scene outside of the train as a false reality that the passengers experience due to lack of air. That air happens to be continuity gas, which grounds those that breathe it in the primary storyline. Think of continuity as the constant reality of the show where overarching serial plots can take place. Once it's established that this train is one big metaphor for storytelling and the production process of Rick and Morty, things start to get real meta. Rick and Morty stumble onto a map that depicts the train as Dan Harmon's famous eight-step story circle that he writes every episode based on. Homie is known in particular for his story circle format that adapts Joseph Campbell's monomyth structure into this. The main character is in their comfort zone, but they want something. In order to get it, they enter an unfamiliar situation where they adapt to their new reality and successfully gather their heart's desire. But once they do, the character pays a heavy price, and they have to return back to their comfort zone having evolved and changed due to their experience. Dan Harmon talking about his own story structure through Rick is about as meta as you can get as a writer. I also love that Rick talks about non-diegetic reality, because film professors love quizzing you about diegetic versus non-diegetic narrative in every FDM 101 class. To please my university, to whom I owe my useless degree, I will recount that diegetic reality exists in the world of a story, while non-diegetic reality exists as something external to that world. Thanks, Dr. Corpy! Halfway through the episode, Rick references an act break, which is basically the suspenseful 30 seconds of a show right before the commercial hits. When we return, Rick and Bird Person are attempting a musical duet, which is the start of a long line of jokes about having to shoehorn in audience pleasers in a blatant attempt to keep the network happy and the merch sales alive, disguised as an inside joke for the fanboys. After donning spacesuits to kill Floaty Bloody Man and cease his suffering, Rick points out that they need to get to the train's engine before the bombs on their vests go off. 
Obviously, this is making fun of that trope where a ticking time bomb adds tension and suspense to any sci-fi, action, or horror flick out there. It also comes with the added benefit of moving the narrative to where Rick wants to get to. After all, usually when you see a timer trope, the character will get to where they need to be just in time. As they progress to the engine, they come across a thematic seal. It's essentially a force field that represents the themes of a story that holds everything together. Rick explains to Morty that to break the seal, they'll need to tell a story that will put their narrative far away from anything that would ever actually happen on their show, thus derailing the story and the train. Rick forces him to think of a scenario that passes the Bechdel test, which essentially is a quick surface test that media critics use to gauge whether a piece of media represents women in a fleshed out capacity. Passing or failing this test doesn't necessarily make a work feminist, but does give a good indication as to whether this piece represents women beyond just common sexist tropes. The rules are simple. The work needs a scene where two named women talk about something other than men for a change. Luckily, Morty thinks of a Bechdel test conversation just in time between his mom and his sister, because menstruation is the only thing women can talk about besides husbands and boyfriends. Ruth Bader Ginsburg even jumps in to congratulate them. This disrupts the continuity, giving Rick and Morty more time to get to the engine. This whole scene reads as a response to criticism that Rick and Morty doesn't pass the test, and sort of rebuttals with, what do you expect? This is a show called Rick and Morty. Still, I'm seeing a bunch of toxic Rickheads saying that Rick is proving that feminism is stupid here, but I think if you consider the writing staff's track record, this scene was intended to be a little more nuanced than feminism is bad. Either way, thanks Rick for all this comment section troll bait! Reminding you now to keep it civil, please. Once inside the control room, Rick and Morty are faced down by the ripped pecs of the Story Lord, played by Paul Giamatti. The Story Lord essentially represents the network execs breathing down the creators' necks to deliver the product they think the masses want, aka a show stuffed to the gills with me seeks wubble of a dub dubs and Mr. Poopy Buttholes. Rather than take a chance on new storylines and characters, the network would prefer they reproduce the same inside jokes that sold thousands of pop funkos over the last several years. As the Story Lord chains Rick and Morty to a device that creates stories filled with rerun characters and overused tropes, our heroes fight against him to come up with the most unlikely plot of all, being saved by Jesus Christ our Lord. This is essentially the same trick they used to break the thematic seal earlier. They derail the story in a direction that isn't natural to regain control. As you can see, the Story Lord is producing these tired-ass episodes of Rick and Morty in order to increase relatability, marketability, and broad appeal for audiences. As much as Rick and Morty plead that their stories aren't infinite, the Story Lord doesn't care and is ready to milk them dry. And it's clear that the writers of Rick and Morty are using this episode to establish that they don't want to be beholden to a sweeping epic that paints by the numbers of the MCU or Star Wars. Having Jesus and his ridiculous abs sail down from heaven to bail Rick and Morty out of a standoff between a bunch of Meeseeks, a 300-esque Spartan Rick army, a gaggle of full-grown Gazorpazorps, Evil Morty, and Emperor Palpatine Mr. Poopy Butthole is kind of the ultimate destroyer of the perfect network-sanctioned episode of Rick and Morty. Outside the train, the episode wraps with the real Rick giving Morty a speech about consumerism that strips the show down to its essence. All that matters is that fans go out and buy merchandise, supporting the series with the almighty dollar. How tongue-in-cheek this monologue is is up for interpretation, but it definitely seems to raise some points as to the mindless consumerism that funds the machine of television. I mean, those spliced-in Wendy's and Pringles commercials weren't exactly subtle. And man, I am such a sucker for targeted ads. Of course I want a spicy, chicky sandwich and some Pringles now. Ultimately, I think this episode drives home the same sentiment shown at the start of the season when Rick fights off Nazi Morty. The writers are feeling an identity crisis with this show. Is it the jokey one-off episodes with the occasional melodrama that they want to tell, or the elaborate sci-fi serial that fans want it to be? People, including the staff of Rick and Morty, always joke about how the toxic fans of this show have impossible standards and have mutated the series into something it was never meant to be. Like the Rick and Morty play toys on the train, this episode aims to derail the established narrative in order to take control from the whims of the quote-unquote story lords. And it may have worked as far as I can see. This episode is one of the most divisive ones yet. And now, everyone's favorite game, Easter Egg Lightning Round. 
The title of the episode itself, Never Wrecking Morty, is a reference to the never-ending story. The bar in the opening scene looks like a mashup of the Moss Eisley Cantina and Sister Margaret's School for Wayward Children, except with napkin holders full of brass knuckles and beers with names like Viper and Killer IPA. Check out the heads on the taps. Those bad boys are callbacks to the snakes from earlier in the season, and the Gromphalmites Rick and Morty are in constant war with. Also, is it just me, or does this guy look like Wolverine and an extremely generic pirate had a baby? Rick's disguise is voiced by none other than Elliot Stabler himself, Christopher Maloney. Now, I want to know what your opinions are of this easter egg in the comments for sure. A lot of people are saying that Rick's ex-girlfriend looks like the White Witch from The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, but all I'm seeing here is a geriatric Queen Frostine from Candyland. Besides, the White Witch would literally never drink red wine in her outfit, although I gotta admit their crowns are pretty similar. Also, did Rick date a female Baby Yoda? If you peep the background of this train car, you'll see posters of Rick and Morty songs like Tiny Rick's Acoustic Set, Morty and Fart's Heartfelt Duet, and of course, Get Swifty. There's also a Sound of Music parody poster that reads The Sound of Rick, as well as a Phantom of the Opera one called Me Seeks of the Opera. Joining Jesus to rescue our heroes are some classic characters from my Christian childhood, aka the gang from VeggieTales. If you haven't listened to the retelling of the events of the Bible spoken to life by singing Dancing Produce, you haven't lived, man. Also, writer Jeff Loveness tweeted to confirm that yes, that is Denver the Last Dinosaur, and that he's totally a born-again Christian now. How that's possible when a lot of Christians don't even believe in dinosaurs is beyond me. You might have noticed a website mentioned called story-train.com. I'm saddened to say that the website led to nothing, unlike prior interactive nuggets for viewers to find. Sorry gang, no in-universe model train set for you. But the story lords over at Adult Swim do actually own the domain name, so who knows, maybe something will pop up on that site soon enough. Or maybe it won't, because having a non-functional website in an episode that detailed and self-aware would be the most meta thing of all. That was a pretty intense episode, so I want to know what you guys think in the comments. Did you think the commentary on television production was hilarious, or have you never lived in Los Angeles? Let me know how you felt about the sewed below, like and subscribe to Nerdwire, and I'll be back next week with Aberdolf Linkler, because that's apparently what the fans want.